Only cool. took 15 minutes of arranging and adjusting. People knew what this well was. Well done. <laughs> it looks so much more legit than it is. Yeah. 15 minutes of our lives right here. <laughs> All right, so uh, since we talked last time, you started that play series on yep. your Instagram, which looked pretty cool. I like the name a lot. A lot of flow, ground movements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just combining some some basic, like breaking down some flow sequences that would typically give people, or, or just even kind of stretches that, mobilizations that blend in some more movement, where instead of just holding the mobilization, just focusing on the ankle, adding in a roll with it. So a little more just getting people used to this more fluid, fluid type movement into these positions, but just giving a little bit of structure so that people have something to go off of. Cause for the ones it's like, like we talked about last time, it's like, well, where, where yeah, do I start? start? But at least these are, are meant to be more the, the gateway into other things that have just exploring movement for someone who has gotten away from exploring movement for so long. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting to, because you did kind of stump me last time with the, the question of like how do you start and having had a little bit of time to reflect on it, it, it I realized that, that the reason it was hard to, for me to relate to is that it's, I think it's more about attitude. And I know I said that before, but I didn't realize that how important I think that actually is. That it really is the, it's the attitude that you bring to whatever you're doing that makes it play versus something else. Um, and so the answer as far as like what kind of movement should you start with is, is really hard because it can be practically anything. Um, and I think the, the how to play if you're type A is the perfect example of that. The, that type A attitude is not very well wired up to come into something without a, within a sort of an exploratory point of view where it isn't about going there, it's just about being here and trying different things and that, and kind of understanding that it's, like we always, even the Mantis stuff, we always organized it as, kind of as a question. It wasn't about going somewhere or an outcome, it, it was, can you do this? Or what happens if I do that? Or, and so it was about just answering the question rather than a positive or a negative outcome based on like, oh, I was trying to go there and this didn't go there, so that's a failure. It's like, well, no, because I've done tons of things where it's like, oh, you go over here and that doesn't work for what I was trying to do at all. But then a week later, a month later, a year later, you run into something else where that outcome over there is totally useful for that. And it builds a, a great, it's a great way to learn and it builds a very broad just depth of understanding of, of how your body functions and what is and isn't okay for you to do and to, where to go and all that. Um, but I really liked the, just the simple movements that you started with. Like that's perfect. I think the only thing to add to it is just that the, as much as there are no rules, that that attitude of just discovery and exploration, what happens when I go here, not that that's good or bad, just, that's what it is, you know, and, and then the next question becomes, does that apply to what I'm trying to do or not? And if it doesn't, then maybe it's gets set aside for now, but, but eventually, in just in the sense of knowing yourself, all of that is beneficial. That's all useful learning. That's all useful experience in some sense. And that, that to me is more, has more to do with the, the point of play and the value of play than any specific movement per se. It doesn't matter what you're doing, it matters the, the sort of attitude and the perspective that you're bringing to it. Yeah. And I think the, the attitude part of it was the hardest part to portray once you start putting the movements together though yeah. too of how do I, and, and that's where you try and write something up and, and hope people read it that it's not, this isn't the end all be all and it's still not that A to B that people yeah. commonly think it is and, and how do you, that they're really emphasizing that there's no right or wrong there's no time limit on this there's no do this for mm -hmm. a minute for five do it as long as you're engaged with it and and early on that might you might have to kind of that fake it till you till you become fake a type thing of, of you it's going to feel awkward at first and it's going to it's going to feel yeah. weird but just but that, doing it and exploring that's how you, and saying that that's how you learn that's yeah, you know that absolutely. that awkwardness is that's a good thing it's telling you something mm -hmm. 
and, and exploring that you're doing some of these different moves and you're like, well, that one, the way he showed it didn't quite feel good, but when I do it this way, and that's right. exactly the the goal objective that trying to get out of it is that we talked about last time there, there is no objective, but just exploring and, and kind of figuring out what, what works for you. Well, and I think that now that you've introduced that sort of handful of basic movements, um, the next step is a really good place to sort of introduce that exploratory nature that you have, was it three, four, four different movements you had? Four, yeah, four, four to five, man. Yeah. You know, that you did them, when you demonstrated them all together, you did them in a certain order. What happens if that order is different? Can you, can you change the order and still make it work? Can you, you know, change the movement, you know, do you have to change one of the movements a little bit to make it work to move into one of the other ones from there? Like, that's that sense of now you have these three blocks how many different positions, how many different shapes, you know, the game becomes rather than, rather than even necessarily doing those specific movements better, unless you're deficient somehow, it becomes how many different shapes can I now make with these basic tools that, that I have at my disposal. And that, that's the, the attitude side of it. And, and I think it's perfectly okay to have that next. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of introduce, here's a couple basic building blocks. All the best games do have a couple simple rules you know, they, yeah. they speak some kind of a basic language, even the, the thing that you did with gluing your hand. Mm -hmm. You know, the only rule there is don't let go. Mm -hmm. You know, but without that rule, you're basically, you're left with a blank sheet and it's hard, it's impossible to get anything done. But yeah. So you kind of, you make that one choice, you make that one rule, or you, you give someone a few basic blocks like you did with that, that program, and then you tell them, okay, how many combinations can you make with that now? And I think that becomes, the sort of doorway to the next, the next level of that. Thing that yeah, that's what really you're fun. talking about. Painting, you have a blank page and you yeah, put purpose. the mark on it, and then it right. gives you something to work. Nothing around. harder than sitting down to draw to a blank sheet of paper and not knowing what you want to draw. But as soon as you make a line, you now have limitations. You have to build off that line, and that become you know you've, you've eliminated probably most of your options at that point, and so. You can get a lot out of what's left. You can do a lot of exploration in the, in you know, it's it's actually a fairly interesting experiment to do. Just sit down to a blank piece of paper and put one line on it and try and turn it into a drawing, even if it's stick figures. Yeah, I think Ido said something like, uh, "Restrictions create freedom." So you give rules and boundaries, and then you have to figure out ways to work around them or figure something else out and that's when you discover and yeah, I agree explore totally. and you know that's play, it, that's why play that, has rules yeah. well and then even in in real life there's that you know gravity is fixed there's always that's always going to be a rule if you get off balance gravity's going to pull you down and so that's always there you know and so there's those kind of basic rules and parameters i think are inherent to any kind of activity and the process of adapting to an artificial rule is no different than the process of adapting to the sort of natural laws that are around us all the time. So that's like babies playing with physics. They are. They totally are. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why I think that it would be really interesting to see, I would love to see actually the people that tried your how to play for type A stuff, like, I would love to see some video of people trying those in different sequences, because some of them are going to go together and some of them are going to be really awkward and probably hysterical to watch. <laughs> that's the awesome part of it. Done yeah. In, yeah, done in different orders and things like that, but that's, yeah. there's a lot to learn there. Yeah, I think you, for anyone watching too, that such a, that the progression is not, it's not a linear thing either. Of You you mentioned a whole bunch of things that, that aren't set things, but give people ways to explore the progressions of it, of put a, put, put a boundary on it, or put an extra thing that you have to do, or with all those moves, only doing the right side. Yeah. And, and bias one side versus the other. DJ does such a good job with it in some of his videos yeah. of it's, here's, yeah, the, got here's the one restriction. Got that figured out. Yeah, here's the one stipulation, go. Like, it doesn't matter how it yeah. looks, the only rule, and, and that's what you mentioned, Dylan, too, with good games have the right amount of rules where it gives you enough guidance, but leaves most of it open. Yeah, and, it gives you a playground. It's like, here's your, yeah. here's the space to play in, now go do something. Um, the... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's really interesting, and that, I think, does, again, in the sense of that, that the natural, rules has, or the natural world has its basic set of rules, is also true 
I mentioned last time that, that you don't have progressions to something unless someone's been there before. So if you're trying to do something that's totally new, even just totally new to you, you're not gonna have a set path from here to there. And that process of, that gives you your direction and then it becomes like a like a shark swimming upstream. You know, you're gonna go over here a little bit until you're like, okay, that's not really helping. And you come back over this way a little bit and, until you find something that that's not really helping. But each time you do that, you're getting a little bit closer and a little bit tighter to eventually achieving whatever direction. And that that, that direction can be those parameters. You know, that if your goal is a handstand, then training splits isn't gonna help. You know, and that's, that's not positive or negative, it's just that in this context, it isn't gonna make a difference. You know, and so you wouldn't do that. You would go back the other way over here and do something that was more useful for that. Just like if you're playing your hand game, taking your hand off makes getting up and down easier, but it misses the point of the game. And in this case, it would be, that would be missing the point of the direction you're mm -hmm. trying to go. That you can substitute those rules for, if you're actually trying to do something real that you don't know how to do, that is the process of narrowing down the things that are going to get you where you want to go. That makes sense. Yeah, I was thinking <laughs> in, a, in a rambling and roundabout way. Yeah, I was thinking when you're. Anyway. <laughs> well, we were all we we're all stumped last time. We're like, so how do you get the? How do we start playing? You're you're a man of the people, so you're asking <laughs> questions. <laughs> right. And I was thinking like, I think it, it would be the same as how do I start exercising? You get a trainer or you go to a class. And that's like one end where it's like rigid, right or wrong. But um, I think that's the appeal of like CrossFit is it's a little more, it's not exactly play, but you're but getting to- you go do something, it gives you some yeah, of those building blocks. And it's we social, about. you know, it's, we don't have many playgrounds we can go to. Cause there the kids go in, they don't make up really new games every time. No. It's handball, four square, and they're just, you know, there's no teacher out there teaching them. The culture just keeps going. Yeah. And um, we don't have that as adults, a playground to just hop in. I and think play. we do, but I think that, that the rules just accumulate and accumulate over time until you're left with nowhere to go. Mm. It's like, it becomes such a, like, no, you're supposed to do it this way. You can't color outside the lines. But there's so many lines that you only have this tiny space in here to do things in. Mm. And that's ultimately not a very good place to be. And, and most of those lines are arbitrary. Most of those lines either are rules that were made for something that made sense in the past and doesn't apply anymore, or they're social rules that don't necessarily apply in out of context. You know, that the, most of those rules are there just because we decided to put them there and not because they actually have to be there. They're not gravity. You can color outside those lines if you want to. And there might be something over there worth learning. There might be something over there helpful. Oh, yeah. It's style points. That's right. You know? <laughs> Even in exercises. Like, why am I do? Why do I have to do this? Well, you know, in competition, you want to get that white light. You have to do that. What right. if I'm not a competitive power lifter? Right. Why does it matter? You exactly. Know? And I don't, I don't think so much that you say that you can color outside the lines, but sometimes beneficial almost to require outside the lines for some people. And that's, that's what the type A was targeting, of not just you're able to do this, but they'll still stick to what's comfortable versus not so much the ability to do it, but the requirement for some people to, to explore that and, and to be outside that comfort zone because they, they want a, a squat to look like a squat and they want right. a push-up to look like a push-up and all these controls. I think, that's, I think that's actually, that's dead on. I think a lot of people, particularly the people that are gonna have the hardest time with play, they've forgotten or or were never taught that most of those rules were arbitrary that, that we put those rules there just for some abstract benefit to society or whatever and that they aren't actual walls they aren't things you can't go and do they're just rules that are there and it, it seems i run into a lot of people who don't even know that you can break those rules let alone mm -hmm. they just assume that that was there and that that's how it should be, and they never even bothered to question what was on the other side of it. And it most of it us doesn't like need that. to be that. Yeah. Well, I think it's a, it's an easy yeah. place to end up, especially in things that you don't have a lot of personal experience with. Yeah, that's that's how I was, and just in the context of exercising, I was very right or wrong um, because that's what I was told was right or wrong. Right. And I didn't really ask, well, why? 
why is it wrong what makes it right um, yeah whenever someone said it's because it's bad or because it's good it's not that's not the answer you want yeah you need a concrete why can't yeah because bad and good are relative if they're they only mm -hmm. they only hold true in context yeah you could say it's more efficient which is true um, and even it's dangerous or safe that's relative to the person mm -hmm. like yeah. you discovered with your Oh, was it a man. Steinberg list lift? <laughs> I was getting uh, death threats <laughs> after that, man. That was impressive as hell, dude. That was a sh Well, I tried lift. yours. Um, <laughs> so your man test um, was doing a cartwheel on top of uh, well, rock climbing. On a climbing wall. Let's just get yeah. on a climbing wall and try and spin around in 360 yeah. degrees. Like. <laughs> People were looking at me, man. I, I did not make. I was falling off. I told you it was. I was like in a handstand, pretty much. For getting really funny looks. Yeah, I didn't make. You want to look ridiculous? That's definitely a way to get it done. Yeah, that's. <laughs> but you learn a lot. It, it was, was fun. Really, too. It's really interesting, and you do have a good time. Yeah. And the floor's soft, so when you fall off and look silly, it's not like there's no permanent harm. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. But the the Steinborg lift, which is apparently how, a thing. I had no idea. Which which I've done before. Um, it's just getting the bar on your back from the ground. Right. So you tilt it up to the side, put your back on it, and then come down. So what I had in the video was an easier scaled version of that, pretty much. Um, and yeah, Depending people... Weight. Right, speak for, <laughs> speak for yourself. <laughs> oh yeah, well the, the weight, you know, is not part of the challenge. That's just yeah. what I had on. But yeah, people I noticed get very upset when you do unconventional things with a barbell. Because I've done those things with a slosh pipe, uh, with rocks, you know, and they don't care. Oh, that's cool. But if you use a barbell, their rules. it's like a sacred thing. Yeah, it's it's because it's a, something with rules. Yeah. No, you have to squat like this. Because they've always been told, and most of them never picture. stop to ask why they're supposed to do it that yeah, way. Yeah, or stop to think, like, what is this tool that I slip weights onto? Of course, and in why the context, are there only three to five things I could do? Of course, in the context that you did it in. I think probably 99% of the people who would try to do that with the weight you had on there would, no, yeah, would in fact no one themselves. Should, it would be a really I don't bad even idea. think <laughs> most people should do that with a bar. Um, and what what does that look like when you don't do it with a bar? The warm up that, you know, the right. squat routine, you know, which m lots of people are doing. So if you can do that, why not, you know, yeah, adding you, a you load? You could add load if it's appropriate. But I'm glad I had people send in videos and they were, you know, doing it with just 10 pounds on each side. So, I like to believe, I have faith that people know what's right. best for them. There's so much context though that's missing for some because uh, I, was, I was telling DJ too, I, I, I just loved how you handled the whole situation with some people too. With some, I mean, some of those comments were ridiculous, and but I uh, had friends questioning me and what I thought because of association through you even with, oh, with, no. how, with how it was. And, and it, it's those are the best of, kind of people yeah, to know though. It, if your friends don't get you, gets you in trouble once in a while. It's then. All, all context <laughs> though. If, if people knew the the work you've put in and the foundation of just general movement that you've built up and that you're not just loading up a bar and they see this, and this, doing snap, silly, this yeah. snap shot of it of mm -hmm. just thinking you're, oh, I'm going to try loading this yeah. super heavy yeah. bar and try twisting under it. But if they've seen your movement practices, there's so much that they're that they're yeah. missing that they don't they don't know how your progressions are and how slow of a process that well, is. Well, I think that was to... that was really the probably the biggest. I was I asking say, for it. I don't I kind, of, <laughs> kind of I don't want to say flaw, but like you didn't show that. I'm sure the first time you tried it, you did it with basically an empty bar, and then you put some weight on, and then like you know it wasn't just. Neither did people doing one handed handstands show the wrist prep and everything sure, they do sure. that goes into it and I, I told I someone more just that it isn't necessarily I think a lot of people watching it don't assume the the process that you went through to discover that oh, okay 315 is okay I can do that well, you know you didn't mm. just put 315 on a bar and do it and just assume that you could you I'm sure you tested a little bit along the way to make sure and that is kind of that that play progression that I was talking about that it's and, like put it on and yeah. see if you can do that hey that feels totally fine I can put load on that and also that what we were talking about last time the the structured and unstructured um, that movement unloaded I was confident I had control of right. the pieces um, and then loading it was just do I have the capacity to handle the load well, and, and, and really those two together it applies to any movement you're doing yeah yeah, yeah and that's that's exactly what I mean that, that in the context 
for you, putting load on that was actually the next launch list. You know, because you'd already, uh, you had already determined that you could do that or something similar to that in an unloaded fashion safely. So adding load, or in this case, really a lot of load. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that, and that's relative because I'm sure if you go back, you know, the Steinborg lift before their squat racks. Right. Um, I'm going to just throw it out there. Too, everyone was progressively getting stronger. And if you look at the history of the squat, which is how old do you think the barbell back squat is? Like, I have no idea. Uh, old hundred barbell. years old, maybe. At least, I saw right? some. At least, if not more so. I saw some history of the squat video, but yeah, they yeah. they showed the guy who was. They have photographs, and it's the ugliest looking squat ever because they don't <laughs> have like a. After decades, this is the most efficient way to biomechanically. Yeah. These people just doing ugly squats, but I have a feeling those people were strong. Oh yeah. Because they were doing it in every which way, just. Imagine if they did it the efficient way, how strong they would be. But uh, well, we're definitely soft as a <laughs> culture and a generation these days. So, well, for the and, and for the people that are like, well, I'm still never gonna try that, and still and still think that example is stupid. Uh, a much more applicable example that we run into all the day, uh, every day, running. How many people are loading up this movement of running? That is your. Can you even? walk without compensation can you stand on one leg without mm. seeing a bunch of hip drop right can you can you crawl can you get on the ground and, and be in these positions yet people can't do these fundamental positions yet they think i'm gonna buy my nike freeze and, and right. jump on the the pavement and you're mm. putting a ton of force through i mean running can be five ten twenty times body weight through through joints and tissues and that's a huge load for someone who a lot of people can't stand on one leg and hold it for 10 seconds without so yeah, and, to, and to spin that back to what I said earlier that is a good example of one of those things where when you're playing and you're experimenting and you're exploring like that those guys that were doing those squats yes they were ugly they were all of those things but I guarantee you that they were not outside of their comfort zone because that's in my opinion the biggest difference between those generations and us is the level of experience with moving themselves around um you know it's I'm trying to think of a good example of it but um when you take a little kid and part of the reason i think that so many little kids thrive in high school sports mm -hmm. is they're coming out of being a little kid and essentially playing with their bodies all day every day for decades they're familiar with all of that stuff you're not going to take them somewhere that they haven't been before I was going to say variety. Um, it yeah, reminds that, me of... That base of variety and experience yeah. is huge. And so, again, running is exactly the same same thing. That If you take someone who is growing up in a natural environment and getting themselves around on their feet all day, they're going to have all of those prerequisites as a result of that huge variety of experience, just moving themselves around, walking to school, running and playing with their friends they have all that stuff because they've been doing all that stuff already so it's one of those things where even if you find something in play that is not productive for what you're trying to do in that game that day that's still a piece you could trace it that back may to have value natural. for something yeah. that you try and do later on you know even if the game is how long can you stand on one foot you know you do that a whole bunch as a 10 year old you're probably not going to be that guy that can't stand on one foot when they're 20 and they want to go running because, and even though that's a silly game when you're 10, it's not a waste of time. It may be mm -hmm. silly, but it isn't a waste. Yeah, <laughs> is, there, is there a movement that's a waste of time? I heard that argued today. By Did you? Yeah, I, a smart person, I respect. Um, but I think it's, it comes back to efficiency, again. And context. If you're going for the most efficient thing to reach this goal, of course, there is a path that's, like you said, well known and paved that we know that works. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Yeah, but what you're talking about, it reminds me of the old school power lifters were it's that farm boy strength. Right. That's they grew up bailing hay and working and then, you know, let's right. see and how so much loading, I can lift they've them been up doing in a, it. And an right. ideal thing is was easy for them mm -hmm. relatively speaking yeah. because they already had this giant but then you get kids now who never do that variety and then are exposed to specific training and don't know anything else and that's I think that's a pretty fragile place to be and you're talking about high school athletes I think that's how it is now for high school athletes yeah. that's why they're getting injured a lot more than they were when we were growing up because we were playing and, and now they're on a computer you know sitting down 
and uh, yeah, getting all those ACL injuries, um, ankle sprains, they're just going from sedentary to um, intense athletic specific sports. Yeah. Nothing in between. Yeah, you're, 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 you have this movement foundation that's getting smaller and smaller, but then we're building bigger and bigger motors on these kids and, and higher and higher engines that they Because can, we know how now. Because we know we how, and they can push a lot of weight, and they can move a lot of things, but that's just, that's a slippery slope that is leading to a lot of these things, and, and Greg Cook talks a ton about that, too, of you can't just keep adding, adding, uh, adding more, more load, more, more speed until there is that base movement foundation there and and the dysfunction is going to show itself at some point if you're missing yeah. it you're going to run out of uh we got a time eventually question over here if you want to talking about dj's instagram post but injury preventing exercises what are things i can do from home or my gym to do that what post was that uh, i assume your steinberg lift or that was about injury. You had, one on the, you had one on the athletes. Oh, the high school yeah. athletes? Oh, uh, yeah, both. Um, what are things I can do at home gym to do that? To prevent injury during exercises. Um, what Dr. Dave does is assess people, I would say, number one. Number two, it's dependent on the exercise. Um, I would break it down to see if you have the fundamentals to perform the exercise. Um, like you just said, a lot of people just hop on their... Nike freeze and start running, you should train to run, you know, first. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's the best answer I can give, general answer. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree necessarily other than just to say that I think any specialization has a price. So the, you want the, basically the largest comfort zone, the largest variety of exposure to types and varieties of load, mm -hmm. angles of load, things like that. And that can start out really, really light, um, you know, but it, again, I think you're standing on a one foot, on one foot example is great. You know, that there's, there's tons of loading going on in a ton of different directions there. It's just not real strong. Yeah. But you're, you're developing see. that stabilization. You're developing that coordination. You're developing the tools that you will need next when you do start to run and, and actually load that up. Um, yeah, so to me, the, the answer is kind of a larger variety, mm -hmm. the less concern with building specific things and, and more concern with just spending a little bit of time being a generalist before you specialize so that you have the basic tools if you get off the, <laughs> off the rails a little bit when you do specialize. Because I think the specialization has, a, has its price. You know, I've, I've kind of, I can basically say I've never hurt myself just screwing around and exploring because the, the loads and stuff are always low enough that even if you manage to get really wonky, it typically doesn't hurt you. Um, it's not until I'm after something specific and really trying to kind of push progression in a certain direction that I've run into problems. Um, so that would probably be my answer is not to pursue specialization at the expense of everything else. Mm -hmm. um, I think your advice for an assessment to make sure that you have the basic function for everything is really spot on. Um, I think if you don't have access to assessments, then that kind of just tons of variety of play. Like, can you do all of that stuff, not mm -hmm. just yeah, you know the the one. You know, if you want to run, then go and try everything related to running first, just a little bit, and see how you respond. Does that feel okay? Does that feel, does it maybe not feel okay? Is it somewhere you need to spend some time? But that variety before you prefer pursue specialization would be my answer. Yeah, and there's plenty of ways to self-assess. It doesn't necessarily mean going in and seeing someone if you're just looking for to generally increase activity. There's, there's tons of ways to self-test it and you can depend on how deep you want to dive into it but there's just foundational things you got to be able to squat and hinge can you touch your toes before you deadlift or do a, a kettlebell swing can you stand can you stand on one leg can you can you line your back and roll just using an arm just using a leg mm -hmm. uh, just basic things of, of 
core strength and, and hip strength and stability. If, if you can't stand on one leg, you probably shouldn't be loading up a, a lunge or a single leg. That is an assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And most people, they stand on one leg and the other one, it's they can't even get to 10 seconds. And the, what do you know? That's when they have hip problems with, or, you know, something. But it's, it's worth saying as well that that's, that's the tool for finding the deficiencies, not necessarily the tool for actually preventing the injury. Um, but it's a knowledge is half the battle kind of a thing. If you, if there is something you're not as good at, the thing that's going to prevent the injury is is bringing that up to par, not, not just finding it. You know, but the, the first step is like you said, it's it's assessment. Whether that's self assessment through play, whether that's going to see a professional and really getting checked out, which is, I can vouch that seeing someone that knows what they're doing shortens that process up a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. I've spent months exploring answers to that. things that were bugging me and then had somebody who knew what they were doing tell me what it was in 20 minutes um, about that last time. <laughs> <laughs> so if you have that opportunity I recommend it um, but you'll learn a lot in the process of figuring it out for yourself too yeah figuring out what doesn't work yeah yeah the, the I'm firmly convinced that that sort of via negativa process learning what doesn't work is as useful if not more useful than understanding what does because oftentimes as i per, as i've pursued things there are multiple paths that will work but then there's all these other things over here that don't work and if i just want that i don't necessarily care which one of these paths i'm on as long as i'm going that way what i don't want to be is spending much time over here doing something that that isn't productive mm -hmm. you know, yeah and not so that trying something and understanding that hey that's not okay that doesn't work or you know that's at least as valuable and, and really probably more valuable that's what uh Nassim Taleb's argument is yeah 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 and the the, the truth is that yeah the, his argument would be that you can't know what does work anyway you can only know what doesn't what doesn't work, work. <laughs> yeah process of elimination yeah and that's kind of what you know I'm sure long term when you're assessing someone and you're being objective, you're like, okay, this looks like a red flag. I don't know if it's the issue, but let's try it. If it helps, no, we'll try something else. And it's really a process of elimination. Is that kind of what you go through? Absolutely, yeah. It's finding the, the couple key things that seem to be standing out of, start with a, you're looking at global movement and just seeing how they do moving with some of these certain things. How does it look when they squat, when they stand on a leg, when they touch their toes, and then Based on that, you start breaking down based on dysfunctional movements. You start breaking the movement down into the segments, and then there's things that tend to pop up through multiple movements of if your hip's not working, that's going to affect how your toe touches, how your squat is, how your reach is. If you're doing an extension too, that's that's all going to going to come up. And then do we know for sure is that the issue? No, but you can kind of lead down that path of, hey, this is this is the biggest thing that keeps coming up attack that issue, recheck some of the movements. Are they better? We're on the right path. If not, let's, let's look at it again could, and see what else we could. Could we say then that the, that the simple answer to that injury prevention stuff is that process of elimination, whether that's a self-assessed process of elimination, whether it's seeing a professional, but the fundamental thing going on there is saying, you know, this is normal, this is normal, this is normal, and eliminating all of those things as possibilities, possible mechanisms for injury down the road. I think so, 100%. Yep. Yeah, I think you should be wary of people who say right away, oh, that's what caused your your injury. Yeah. Because it could be something downstream, like related, you know, a third secondary effect that we don't know. So just the process of elimination is the best you can do, I think. I've definitely sort of in progress learned to be humble about all that just because it's it's very tempting to think you know what's going on um but i've been proved wrong so many times that that but i think that the, the the valuable thing with that process of elimination with that empirical approach is that that it's even if you think you know what's going on even if you're totally wrong even if you know absolutely nothing about anatomy any of that sort of stuff that process of elimination will still eventually take you to something that works you won't know why it works you won't know what happened in the first place that got you hurt. You won't know any of those things, but you will eventually arrive at something that will help solve the problem without any actual uh, without any actual 
knowledge of what really is changing to make it better. Um, that, though, is what I was talking about, that that process mm -hmm. on your own can take a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it can take a long time, but I agree it's 100%. Whereas with a professional, it goes a lot, a lot faster. Mm -hmm. I agree it's 100% necessary in terms of the things you, you learn from that, but just for, and this is a sort of different segue, but just when you're doing that self-experimentation, make sure you're not, just a side note, make sure you're not changing too many variables because that gives you the opportunity to find out, like you just mentioned, you want to know why mm, something's yeah. working or why something's not working. If you change five things every week and you're getting right, incredibly better, better, you could it could be mm. one thing you're doing that's doing all that. And and in fact, probably is one thing and, most not, the time and not all of the time is one thing. That seems to be a theme in all the stuff we're talking about, though, that, that when I'm talking about the play stuff, I'm thinking of it very much as an experiment. I know that, that context of, hey, I wonder if, or what happens if, is very much that experiment of, of what happens when I do that. Like, what is, you know, and that there's value there, whether that's a positive or a negative. You know, if it's a negative, it's one more thing to eliminate. If it's positive, then you're closer to where you were trying to go. More information is always a good thing. When it's that kind of real empirical information and not random stuff you read on the internet. I mean, like information <laughs> through your body, yes. felt, felt direct information. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the the thing that informs your ability to do that 315 Steinberg lift is that that's, you have already comfortably eliminated all of the things that were likely to hurt you in doing that. So you knew that the odds you could do that safely were pretty good before you got into it because of that variety of experience and play beforehand. You know, that if you've never done something before, it's probably a really good idea to take a little bit of time and run through all those, you know, that process of elimination and make sure you don't have something going on, on that, mm. that would contraindicate doing that. Yeah, and, and it's, you could scale that to what people do every day. I saw a 90 pound yogi doing uh, handstands on the back of their hands against the wall. Yeah that would destroy my wrists. <laughs> that would tear me up, right. you know? But you you look at it and you respect, they have prepped themselves for this, and their, pro their wrists are probably better off than mine, to be honest. It doesn't hurt that they're only 90 pounds too, but. Yeah. But you don't see that video either and say, hey, this is the supus exercise, uh, I'm gonna go and be a, a wrist surgeon and I'll see you in, you know, those just aren't well, things that. Weak, weak people, uh, hate strong people for the most part from what I've seen you know it, I think, it's I think hard for a always... stronger person that if Juju Mufu was like you're gonna kill yourself that's stupid I'd be like maybe I should reach <laughs> <that."> <laughs> you know <laughs> uh, I think that's just a that's human nature when people see someone doing something that they wish they could do or whatever one of the common responses is that very negative I think it just makes them feel better about the fact that they can't do it. Maybe. And and context is also that maybe they shouldn't do it. You know, that, that most, for them, a lot of those people arguing against it are probably. I think it's right. common sense that most people should not replicate that exact load. Yeah. 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 Well, again, it's context. People people picture themselves in that situation. Yeah, then they have a perfectly legitimate argument that no, you shouldn't be doing that. You're going to get hurt if you do that. But taking they don't see all the all the prep that they goes into the context that, that went into it like you were saying yeah yeah maybe it comes from a good place like they don't want people to see that and go out and get hurt themselves another question yeah I think it's, can i scroll down right there is there is there such a thing as overcomplicating mobility and flexibility outside of the basic mechanics of full control good range of motion in things like the squat press pull, lunge, et cetera, et cetera. I think absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I think, um, okay, so I think mobility and strength, it's, they're very similar, because a lot of people ask, what do I do to be I, mobile? Or I kind of think mobility? of them as just different aspects of the same thing, really. Yeah, well, but I'm saying people think one thing is gonna give them overall mobility, but it's specific. What do you wanna be mobile in? What specific right. movement? Same as strength, I wanna get strong strong and what squat deadlift you know it's all specific so um if you're looking for what was it comp 
mobility and basic mechanics. Yeah, I think yeah, that's just, a good idea. Is, is there such a thing as overcomplicating mobility and flexibility outside of the basic mechanics of push, pull, squat, etc.? Yeah, I think Definitely. if you're looking for mobility in something that's not a goal of yours, like you don't need to do the splits or want to, then you shouldn't uh, be training specifically for that movement. Yeah, I believe 100% we overcomplicate things way, way too much and and general movement gets gets pushed to the wayside now with how much we just know so much now about, about we talk about biomechanically the perfect place to be in all these movements and it gets us into trouble if you look too much at individual parts and while the individual parts have to be moving, uh, we, we absolutely overcomplicate it and there are people that need to focus more on the individual parts. If you have a joint that's not moving, that's limiting your squat, then absolutely got to attack that aspect. But too many people create problems in themselves that they don't necessarily have because they see all this information and they try these tests and they try things on, on Instagram. There's just a mile a minute. You got all this information. You see these things. And you're like, oh, I got it. My shoulders must be weak. My core must And for some people, <laughs> yeah. For most people, yeah. But for some people that have a good base of movement, they don't need to be spending time on these correctives. They need to be spending time pushing, pulling, hinging, squatting. But uh, it's it's all it's all a spectrum too. You can't go too much, and, and your workout shouldn't look like only correctives. But for for some people, their workout right now is going to look like only correctives, and that all depends on on where you're at. If you're a super immobile person, then don't convince yourself to think, yeah, I just have to push, pull, and hinge and squat more. If you're doing it with lousy form but on the other end if you only prioritize flexibility or uh, some yogis that only do only do yoga they benefit from from strength and vice versa so it's it's this huge spectrum and knowing where it's at but but taking a step back and say is this something i really need to do or is it just something flashy something cool something that other people are doing if everyone's foam rolling at the gym that doesn't mean you need to jump on a foam roller i agree good answer and I th my experience has also has been that mobility without strength and stability is actually worse than being a little bit tight. I would yeah. much rather have slightly. I mean, obviously, I'd rather have, I'd rather have, a, I'd rather have <laughs> a little bit of limitation than Definitely. be hypermobile. Several of the injuries I have dealt with over the years related pretty heavily to being able to go places that I wasn't really able to stabilize and control effectively. Control is better than, yeah, yeah, passive, uncontrollable flexibility. Yeah, and get into the details and semantics of it. Flexibility, mobility, you can argue are different things where if, I, if well, you're, you can what's be your very definition? flexible. I think, I, I categorize mobility as actually can you control through those motions where flexibility is more your passive. Yeah, no, like you, <laughs> your passive ability to get into these positions. So flex, if someone's flexible, you can check their hamstring length and bring them up to, for some people, 115 plus degrees of, of uh, hip and hip flexion, but actively, can they even yeah. get to 90? And, and that's more mobility. Is so mobility implies strength and stability. Yeah, yeah so it, yeah, it is a spectrum Mobility is the ability yeah. to use a range of motion rather than the ability to go somewhere. So really, we're talking about someone just focusing if they're limited on mobility exercises. That might be their strength workout, you know? Dude, um, I've done some mobility work that was as hard as any strength workout I've ever that's done. That's what I'm sure. doing right now. I'm sweating <laughs> during my mobility, quote unquote, right. work. But and I'm it's sore. It's, yeah. it's weighted end range work, Yeah, I, whatever that means for me. Max okay. Shank, I think he said, um, mobility work is just in range strength training. Yeah. You know, and I, I like that. Mm -hmm. That was why I was saying I think there are, there are two different words for something that really is kind of the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that the question is, can you control yourself through that range of motion? And if you can, then that's that to me is mobility. That to me is correct function. And mm -hmm. then it, if you can go somewhere but you can't control it, that's not particularly good. And then, but if you're strong and you have great control, but your the range is limited. That's also an issue, mm -hmm. which is, I think, what you said already. And then you, you load it. that range okay. and you got yourself a squat or a, you know, whatever right. pattern you want to put together. But a lot of people can squat um, with 400 pounds on the bar to depth, but can't hit that depth with Without an unloaded bar. That actually brings up a question in my, in my mind, and it's something that 
how where do you guys fall on the idea like I know FRC and those guys they always want you to be able to actively use a range of motion unloaded before you load it mm -hmm. and I have found personally playing with that that that's not as cut and dry as they they say it is I've found a lot of mobi what I consider mobility movements were better with I mean admittedly five or ten pounds but with some sort of load that the, the movement pattern would be dramatically different if I was doing something unloaded versus holding weight in my hand and doing the same thing. Um, anyway, and it seems very appropriate to load some things more or less immediately, um, but not everything. And I'm, where, do you guys, where do you guys fall on that? Is it, is it do you always have to start with no load? Well, I think where FRC, would, what they would argue, is, um, so you're talking about weight, where you're having to, um, you know, tense and, and produce force with your tissue that's against the weight. Um, and they're, you know, the isometrics they use is the same concept. You're doing a, you know, producing as much force. So it's mimicking a load, except... They're just not necessarily they're, using they're external not, load. Yeah, not external load. They want you to produce it intrinsically before adding load. But it's the same concept, you know. Yeah. My thoughts on depend on again comes a little bit back to what, what your goal is, adding a weight as feedback and, and that can give mm -hmm. people a lot of kinesthetic sense in terms I, of I joint feedback. I think that's feedback kind of what I'm feeling that's right. That makes sense for what Yeah. So if using that you get joint approximation or distraction, that can give a lot of feedback to your tissues on okay and that can help to train you get a better movement pattern out of it. I don't see a problem with that. But if you're adding load to add load of like, hey, this is I need to just get more weight through this movement isn't isn't the right way to go. To and push I think me down. Yeah. That actually yeah. sounds like a perfect uh, description of what I'm talking about because the, the first thing that came to mind was a Tico. And that, that just doing the movement unloaded feels completely different than holding a five pound plate in my hand and doing it. And the five pound, five pound plate is appropriate. It's not too heavy, but, it, but the the activation, the, the movement pattern, the, the muscles in my shoulders and things like that that are on and involved in doing it with that little bit of external load feels very different than just doing it unloaded. Yeah, I wouldn't confuse that with FRC though, because say I'm sure the loaded teacup, like at this area is where you really like feel it when I do it loaded, you know, in that internal. I mostly just feel that the pattern was very different. It was like my my whole arm and shoulder girdle move differently. Yeah, because you're, bit of load you're forced to irradiate more. Through your, through your whole body. I mean, with anyway. that um, And yeah, I think learning a radiation um, without weight has um, has benefits. Something I should play with, maybe. Yeah, dude. Uh, was it dude? No. Mart Martin Martin, uh, one of the teachers with Edo. A lot of that stuff was irradiating through movements, like you're going through like sand and then dropping the level and doing it and going over patterns, switching the um, tension in your body. And it was, that was super interesting. Okay. Trying falls stiff, falls loose. Um, a lot of, I got a lot of feedback, learned a lot about some stuff that was hard to relax, uh, hard to tense. So yeah, adding the weight, I, I do that with teacups. I like that <laughs> with rocks. No, and I think I think just even just the way you describe it, the I think he nailed what I'm, what mm -hmm. I was feeling in there. So, and it, it, again, there's based on your goal too. If some people that little bit, just that little bit of load, and not doing it to not doing it to make the exercise harder, but actually to improve the movement pattern is right. different than if you're like, hey, I, I just want to get stronger through this motion, so I'm going to add more weight to it and. But, and then there's the other end of people that we talk about, people that squat and need some weight to do that. You think of a goblet squat's a great, a great, great way to improve mm -hmm. mobility for some people that are tight. And then for them, it's starting out with a heavier load. If they can get into a good position, I'm okay with them starting with a heavier load and then you're trying to lighten the load for them. So it starts yeah, heavier. Teaching them to act you start with a 50 pound, you're going to 40, uh, 30, Jefferson 20. Curl springs to mind the same, the same thing that, that it, a tight hamstring is teaching someone a Jefferson curl, whatever, like having them actively do that isn't going to produce the same results that letting them hold on to a little bit of weight Which and resist that weight and let it pull them into a bigger stretch, 
plus the, the strength development they're going to get from that. I jack my stuff up doing Jeff's and Curls. Did you? Getting, yeah. With a barbell, just a barbell, um, which I probably should progress with lighter weight. But um, yeah, I think it, it depends. If you can't actively control that um, weight, then it's going from a passive stretch with load, which I think is dangerous, to something you could apply force against, which is the feedback, which is great. Which is why we use bands, like, if your knee drops in, uh, you know, we'll put a band pulling it in even more, so you have to fight against it, which is giving you feedback, which right. is, I think, Yeah, the, the idea benefit. is that the load is the, yeah. the minimum necessary to get the feedback, not, you're not trying to load the, you're not trying to train the muscles, you're literally, you're trying to train the nervous system to activate them differently. Yeah, so I think that's, that's super beneficial. Cool. Want to scroll up and down on I don't know, I don't want to push anything and delete it all. Don't mind me. <laughs> <laughs> Doing yoga stretches as I watch this. Great talk, guys. Oh, yeah. Yoga, three Ds in yoga. <laughs> like 50 plus minutes. Okay. Can you stop logging in live? Ha, ha, ha. Very funny. Yeah, but do you want to talk about the uh, hike you're going to do? Next year? <laughs> you <laughs> might do? I mean, it's in the plans. Uh, it's, I don't know, it, they, without a lot of context, it's hard to explain, but it's called the Sierra High Route. It's 195 miles of uh, off-trail travel down the spine of the Sierra Vaz, going from just north of Yosemite down the, down the mountains for 200 miles. 200 miles. And I think uh, 40, 40 miles of it is on trail and the rest of it is cross-country travel, like backcountry navigation, no established route of any kind other than like GPS waypoints and dead wrecking off of mountaintops and things like that. So living in the woods for a few weeks. That's manly. That's, <laughs> that's man-tastic. That is yeah. the man right there. <laughs> well, a whole month of man <laughs> With a little luck, I'll be well prepared and it won't be a big deal, but. Yeah, and that's gonna be interesting to see you prepare for that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of looking at it as just, uh, physically it's just gonna be work capacity and then having the joint integrity to, to go travel across that terrain for 10 plus hours a day every day for a few weeks. So, it'll take a little building up too, but yeah, I'm reasonably confident I'll survive. And we're gonna video that live. That live, live. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, will be taking cameras. I will be taking cameras, so there, there will be pictures. Yeah. For sure. Perfect. And your man test, your kettlebell, was strong first, right? Yeah. Well, that's coming out in a couple months, so, yeah. A couple months? Yeah. How's the training it? for that? Good. We, talk, uh, we talked about it last time, too, with, uh, we were talking about pull-up bars and everything, but, yeah, I, uh, doing snatches, high-volume snatches, busting my hand open a little bit. Right. <laughs> that's manly right there, too. No, I don't know. You get some blood with, on your hand. With that you know? being manly, I think that's uh, <laughs> more of the line of stupid when it affects your training the next next couple days or so. Yeah. But I think that's cool. The course this weekend, though. You guys are both uh, <laughs> training for a goal. You know, you have something specific. Well, and that's some of that negative feedback you're talking about. That clearly that was too much. So yeah, probably over gripping, and you know, you're learning. You're learning something out of that. You're paying a little price for it. But that that'll, that'll make so you better. Makes it feel good. It's that'll make you better at doing it next time. But you can show it to the girls, you know. <laughs> yeah. Unless the they're CrossFit, unless they're CrossFit girls, yeah. in which case they'll have worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my fifty uh, kipping pull-ups took some skin off. Yeah, that'll be good because the course is three days. It's pretty intensive, so you hear people tearing their hands up all the time. Oh, so sure. Just learning from that ahead of time and not just going in to a three-day course of pretty much non-stop using kettlebells and you bet you gotta learn at some point along the way yeah. right do you have chalk and stuff that, i would imagine that would solve a lot of that yeah i got chalk chalk is beautiful stuff yeah <laughs> i over chalk <laughs> all the time chalk See, i think core. the kettlebells i have though it's just very i think they're meant to the rogue ones have a lot of like a lot of grip to it so it doesn't it just doesn't really slide in my hand when i do it even more. okay so those aren't and you're holding like you're holding all the way down in there though like i would i get them up here, you know, I get them up here typically. But I think it's from it's pinching. So oh, that would make sense. And you're you're flipping, you're snatching, so you're catching it up top too. 
it's, it's definitely going to swing down in there. It's all learning process. Oh, well, and that's, well, that's exactly what we're talking about. That that's <laughs> I might have the prettiest hands here. Yeah. You do. Yeah, them. like Dr. Dave's toy. <laughs> right? He's definitely got us beat. What's going on there? <laughs> physical Snatches. therapist hands don't aren't cow up. Yeah. Right, the wrong person. Yeah, not the right guy. Maybe he can't deadlift as much as you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anything, cool. else? Anything else we got? We got a question. Yeah, questions. What is the best way to make my own sandbag, and what weight should I aim for? I've done that a few times. A couple, couple, couple hefty bags tied in knots in a, in I used a fairly cheap REI stuff sack, uh, tied off the end, wrapped some duct tape around it, five dollars for fifty pounds of sand, and, uh, and it lasted. Yeah. It lasted me six months, I think, for fifteen bucks probably. Oh, nice. But you definitely beat it up, and it's hard to hold on to. It doesn't have any kind of grip or anything like that. But 50, yeah. But it did the job. 50 pounds whooped my ass, too. Yeah, I think for Melissa, um, that would be 50 pounds would be good. Yeah, I would start off with 50. Even just uh, those bags at Costco rice that are 50 pounds, maybe put some bags around that. There you go. But, uh, but yeah, so just to, what I did literally was, uh, was typical, like, kitchen hefty bags. It was a 50 pound bag of sand for $5 from Home Depot. And then just a mediocre stuff sack that came originally from REI that I just had already. Um, and then tie them all off, cinch it down, duct tape the end. Worked fine. Mm -hmm. It was definitely not ideal, but it did the job oh, just fine. Yeah. Yeah, if you're not getting crazy with them. Like I have the uh, strong fit bags. Yeah, the early <laughs> ones. Dude, those you, they have videos of them dropping off of like four story buildings, <laughs> just it's not breaking. Fine. But yeah, I think um, that'd be perfect. With a 50 pounder, you could do squats, carries, um, cleans. And if you leave a little bit of, you leave a little bit of space and don't pack it too tight into the bags and stuff, the, the, the little bit of slosh makes it pretty easy to handle as well like a little bit like the ones you have are pretty seem reasonably solid tight yeah um the one the one when i did that one i, I left probably a little bit too much room but it made it a interesting because it yeah. made it a little squirmy but it also made Which it so good. that you could it also made it so that you could throw it over a shoulder and the sand would sit down in the ends and not mm. and it would kind of stay there and you could use it for things that where it wasn't just trying to roll off all the time but yeah i liked it i found it i love sandbags and I don't have too them. much experience with them. I'm sure this weekend get a full yeah, dose of them. <laughs> but yeah, it just it's more uh, variability, more squirminess, mm -hmm. uh, and because it's more complex, I feel like it's more inclusive. So you don't have to have the perfect like a barbell clean or snatch, the perfect technique, um, and hit the sweet spot. You could just muscle that thing up. And but it gives you a lot more leeway. And it allows you to experiment and, and figure out maybe what is the most efficient way for you to do that. You know, the, this grip is, this is way harder, but under here is better mm -hmm. or, or whatever. Yeah. Uh, they look, honestly, it sounds sort of funny, but they look like they would be a reasonable approximation for something like rings. The, that they, mm -hmm. they move enough, uh, yeah. but in the right ways that you can still put a lot of load in them, you can still do a lot of work, but... but it's not ideal in like the the way a barbell is or the way something you know the, the ring wants to move convenient. so you have to you have to resist that as well the sandbag wants to move the sand is kind of trying to get away from you while you're moving it around mm -hmm. and picking it up yeah and i feel like you'll never you'll never carry it the same exact way no never two times it's always a slightly different load um yeah and i think that's it was Carl Paoli said, and this is a takeaway quote I got from him, the yeah, more 